Welcome into Attacking Third, brought to you by PNC Bank, brilliantly boring since 1865. Darian Jenkins, Lisa Carlin, and I'm Jenny Chu here for you this beautiful Thursday. So much to talk about in the world of women's football, Darian, but what are you most looking forward to talking about? Yeah, oh my God, we have so much women's football <laughs> to cover. Um, I think I'm looking forward to the She Believes Cup. It's going to be a fun tournament to see how these teams are adapting um, and preparing for the Olympics. Yeah, international windows are always fun to talk about because we get to dive into these different national teams. And there's a lot on the line with Olympic qualifying. Um, and for the She Believes Cup, it's the final big matches before mm -hmm. the Olympics this yeah. summer. Euro qualifiers as well. Kaf, we're going to be talking about that. There's so much. But first, we're going to get started with some news. Arsenal provided an update on Frida Monum today following her collapse during the Conti Cup final this past weekend. The club stated that Monum has undergone extensive testing, whose results have been reviewed by two leading cardiologists, and no obvious cardiac causes have been found. Monum has been fitted with a monitoring device that will track her heart function and will make a progressive return to training. We go over stateside to NWSL now, where Racing Louisville announced that Ellie Pico Yamsa has suffered a season-ending injury after tearing her patella tendon in the match against Portland this past weekend. We here at Attacking Third wish Ellie the best, but Lisa, what does this injury mean for Racing Louisville? This is a huge loss for Louisville's back line. As a center back in her second year with the club, she um, was starting alongside Abby Erseg and really a, a namestay in that back line. I think it definitely opens up a lot of question marks. Ellie Jean has come off the bench and subbed in for Picky Yamsa the last three weeks and has gotten minutes, but this is a racing Louisville side that has failed to complete a 90 minute match the last three weeks. They had two 2-0 two leads in two different matches and they failed to close out the games. Defensively, you have to have a little bit of stability and structure. Um, it is still early in the season, so hopefully Bev Yanez can kind of establish some rhythm and partnership now between most likely Abby Erseg and Ellie Jean mm -hmm. in that center back pairing, but it's definitely a tough loss for, for Picky Yamsa and for Louisville. Yeah, Darian, um, obviously not something we want to see, but let's go ahead and turn over to some good news and new signings that we've had in the NWSL. Lacey Santos joined the Washington Spirit on a three-year deal. This is Jonathan Hidalgo's first signing, really, and that is going to add to Trinity Rodman, Croy Bethune, Ashley Hatch, and Saar as well. Darian, what does this amazing Colombian player that we watched all during the World Cup bring to the table? Yeah, I think this is an incredible addition to the Spirit. Uh, that you know, I think, People are saying, oh, she's going to fill in for Sanchez. I think she's going to make her own namesake in this position with the spirit. Signing for three years, they obviously want her a part of this team. They're going to help build around her and the elements of her game that she can bring with Rodman, Saar, Hatch. Yeah. I think it's going to be really dynamic. Croy Bethune, um, rookie we're all loving to see play with the spirit. So I think this is a really good addition. Um, it's going to make them more threatening. And we're seeing the spirit build their style of play. And I think signing her is a big testament to what Jonathan Heraldez is really trying to do with technically having these midfielders, um, how they're going to feed the forwards, how they're going to be dynamic, because she is incredible. She changes between the lines. She rotates a lot. I think it's going to be really, really threatening for the spirit moving forward. Her addition in the midfield for Washington is also going to add a different element of width mm -hmm. that Washington doesn't have centrally right now because Lacey Santos um, can also play on the left side. She does like to float out there when she is a central midfielder, which can create overloads in the wide area for uh, Bethune and with Rodman on the other far side. That's going to be really nice. Uh, I mean, it's going to be really hard for opposition to try to defend against not only Bethune coming out of the midfield, but now potentially Lacey Santos come this summer and just create a lot of different overloads. I think we'll finally start to see what Giraldez and Gonzalez want to do with this Washington Spirit side, especially after Lacey Santos gets there. Yeah, especially with Giraldez not even being here yet, right? He's leaving after his Barcelona season and then uh, this Lacey Santos addition to Washington Spirit. How do they kind of put things together after things have already gotten started in NWSL? We move over to Ramone Bachman joining Houston Dash immediately. She won't even finish her season with PSG. Um, she's also played with Chelsea, Wolfsburg, Rose Guard. She becomes the second ever Swiss NWSL player. Um, this was interesting because Houston Dash needs some defenders. They need to defend, um, I was thinking, make some defensive signings. And then we have this addition, Diana Ordoñez scoring a brace this past weekend. Uh, Darian, how do you see her kind of fitting in and why they decided to sign her? I mean, Houston Dash needs all the help they can get, but why not a defensive signing, right? Maybe they're taking a note out of Kansas City's book. They're saying, you know, we're still going to outscore everybody. <laughs> you might score on us, but we're going to score. Uh, no, I think it's a good addition. I think it brings competition to that front line for Houston as well, which is good. I think maybe that team is needed a little bit more of a push 
on the front line because we talk every week about Ordonez and Sanchez um, as being two of the players that Houston only has to attack, really, depending on who they start. But I, I like this. I think it'll be good. She's obviously going to be hungry to play, hungry to score goals. I think she fits this league well. But yeah, Houston, I'm, I am curious what this move was. Uh, obviously, you want to get a good striker when you can, but clearly they need help in the back. They need help in the midfield. Um, they have three players that are playing center back. Lisa, you guys talked about this on Attacking yeah. Dirt yesterday that aren't center backs. Yeah. That affects your entire team's play. Everybody has to drop below the half to try to connect, to try to help out defensively. You don't have as much confidence in your back line. So for the style that Coach Alonzo is saying that they, he wants to play, I'm, I'm not really sure how this makes a lot of sense. And unless she's also going to become another center back, who knows? But it'll be it'll be interesting to <laughs> that see. Would Lisa, be make sense. <laughs> that would sense be of this. hilarious. You're a center back. You're a center back. You're a center back. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps that this signing was in the works long before the season mm -hmm. started, and it just took a little while to kind of get over the line, whether the, the HR loops and everything through the league, that ultimately now it's being announced and Bachman will be joining the Houston Dash. Frankly, they need help in their attack, too. I'm not like, yeah, yes, it's it would have been a smarter decision to sign a defender at this point, preferably one center back on the roster, but they need help in their attack, too. They got three goals in over Bay FC, but it took way too long in the mm -hmm. match to grow into it. They need a forward that can bring in veteran experience. Um, Bachman has won five trophies with different clubs, so she understands a variety of styles of play. I think she's actually going to fit in pretty well in being able to link some of the pieces that Houston has in their front line, whether it's Alozia or Amanda West, the rookie coming in, and then, of course, Ordonez and Sanchez that just need someone else in their attacking line to help them get over the finish line and score goals. I love it, but I'm just thinking about Jane Campbell right now. She's probably thinking, give me a real center back, please. When are we making this <laughs> signing? We go over to She Believes Cup, which kicks off Saturday, April 6th. We're going to be talking after the show for that as well. But there is a slightly abridged tournament compared to the previous years where there was three matches played for each team. Now they only play two matches. The U.S. Women's National Team start off against Japan on Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern time on TNT. And Canada plays against Brazil at 3.30 p.m. on Peacock. Let's go through these teams, though, because obviously USA, <laughs> Japan, Canada, Brazil. Uh, let's get started with Canada here, Lisa. Obviously, Desiree Scott and Janine Becky are now back from injury. Huge, huge news for Canada. Give me a preview into this team ahead of this tournament. It's huge that Canada has Scott and Janine Becky back on this roster. Not sure how many minutes we'll get out of Desiree Scott, but as a veteran, um, who's played at the international level for so long. She brings a sense of stability for this Canadian side that Bev Priestman is yearning for. And they didn't have all that much during the W Gold Cup. I want Canada to grow off of the foundation they laid at the W Gold Cup, whether that's switching formations, a three back, a four back, the versatility of Chloe Lacasse to be all over the pitch and Adriana Leone in incredible form during the Gold Cup. But it's because they played a, a little bit more confident and brave on the ball during that tournament, which allowed them the freedom to have much more creativity because the talent at, that Canada has on their roster is so incredibly high and it hasn't been utilized enough in the past with playing a lot of direct balls, utilizing set piece play and over the top um, balls that it doesn't play to the style that a player like Chloe Class or Adrian Leon wants to play. They want the ball at their feet. They want to keep it. Uh, this roster is also without the young player, uh, teenager Olivia Smith, which due to injury, she's not going to be called in, but I think it's a big loss for them. She just provides a different wrinkle when she gets thrown into the games for Bev Priestman. But it's I'm excited for this tournament and really excited to see how Canada um, continues to level up their formations and tactical play. Yeah, we've seen a lot of changes since Bev Priestman. Um, since Aaron West called it, what, boring, cold Plain oatmeal, oatmeal Plain or something? Oatmeal. We saw They've got plenty some seasoning, of a little cinnamon, <laughs> brown sugar. Oh, craisins. <laughs> craisins. <laughs> Craisins to my oatmeal as well. Yeah, that was a great delicious. show. Lisa. Um, we saw some good stuff in the W Gold Cup from Canada. Obviously, one of the big goal scorers there was Adriana Leon. Um, we've seen her and, and everything that she can do. Now with the addition of Janine Becky, so excited, and Desiree Scott giving some structure there in the center as well. Let's go over to Brazil. Um, it seems like they're using this roster to decide their Olympic roster. We're seeing a lot of the peripheral players, if we want to use that terminology as well, and lots of players that we have seen typically with the uh, Brazilian national team are not part of this, Biaz Anderato being one of them, Dabinha as well. Um, what do you say about this team here and how they're kind of approaching this tournament here, Darian? 
Uh, I mean, I like this. I think Brazil is showing that they have a lot of depth. These players didn't get to, a lot of these players didn't get to perform in the W Gold Cup, um, adapt to this new style of play that's not so reliant on Marta anymore. I think they've had a big identity change. Same with Canada, frankly. I think that they had to do the same thing without Sink being there. Someone that they let lead the team in every facet of the way, just give her the ball and she's going to figure something out. So now they have all of these different wrinkles. They have all these different threats. I like it. I love seeing Marta back in camp. I'm not saying that that shouldn't be a thing, um, but I think that it's going to help them adapt to a different style of play. You know, players get injured often, so having all of this depth come in and be able to train and play in a really difficult competition against heavy hitting teams is only going to make them stronger. I love seeing Marta in, Angelina, Yaya, who is so yeah. exciting to play in the W, or watch her play in the W Gold Cup. Yasmeem is another one that's going to get more playing time. Um, these are players that are leaders on the team that I think are going to make a name for themselves in this tournament. Lisa, do you see any of these, I guess, peripheral players, as we're going to call them right now, making this Olympic roster? Like, who should we keep our eye on to, hey, you know what, if anyone's going to knock out a big player or potentially, you know, make the end of this roster, who would that be? Yeah, I think when you talk about some of the players that haven't been called in for Brazil, it is because of injury, right? Dabinia yeah. out right now, which opens up a hole. So often we talk about, hey, how can you make the Olympic roster? But m more often than not, Jenny, it's who isn't going to fill a spot because you mm -hmm. have to take that role away. And unfortunately, injuries is one of the ways that that happens. So I'm hopeful, of course, that everyone stays healthy and things continue to get better. But for Brazil, there are more opportunities. I honestly think Yaya is kind of solidify yeah. her spot in the midfield. And with her attacking presence that she can bring up front, it definitely brings a different wrinkle to this for Lily. Brazilian side. I also think that because there are so many injuries and things that happen uh, going to the Olympics, you need players that can adapt and play different positions. So I think bringing in a different roster, having these players that can play multiple positions, different formations, this is really good training to go into that Olympic environment where, hey, this might happen, this player's art, this right. player's too many minutes. How are you going to slot in? How are we going to fix and plug these holes? So. I like this. I And you're right. I think Yaya is going to be a staple mm -hmm. for this team. She was so impressive. Love to see it. We're going to be talking more She Believes Cup after a quick break. And we're going to be picking our 11s for the U.S. Women's National Team match against Japan. So stick with us. To be in this atmosphere, to be in this beautiful stadium, you have to show up and show up. Women's tournament football in this part of the world. And we'll get us started here. Applying the pressure throughout this first half, and it finally tells. Such a joy to watch. You take the advantage, and you run past it, and you make that great decision. Header. Yes! Finally, Canada scores! Decent cross, and it oh! The Canadians have drawn level. Casey lets it rip. Yes! That is so hard to do. Nice first touch there from Antonia. Curls it out of the bottom corner. Brazil in full control. And this could be it. And the finish, Sophia Smith. team will play against Japan at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta on Saturday at 12.30 p.m. Let's go ahead and preview this match because this is the one we're looking forward to, to seeing the U.S., but let's get started with Japan here. They are qualified for the Olympics in Paris, and what do we expect from this team? Because we've seen them in the She Believes Cup before, mm -hmm. and basically, even if they didn't perform that well in the She Believes Cup, we then saw them deploy those same tactics in the Women's World Cup and kind of how they use that tournament. How do you see Japan using this tournament here? Oh, Jenny, remember this summer, Japan was incredible to watch. Mm -hmm. They looked so organized. They had really good tactics that also varied from opponent to opponent during the World Cup. Remember they beat Spain 4-0, guys. Um, that yep, match yep. was incredibly impressive to watch. But what's really fun about Japan is that they are really controlled and dictated in their style of play. They make these little overlapping runs. They have slip passes that get in behind, but they're not afraid to go direct, but they're intentional direct balls. They're not just dumping it in over the top because the, vertica the verticality and the speed that Japan has allows them to get in behind, but they use their long balls on diagonals. So it's their wide outside back players or their wide wing back players that receive the ball in the flanks. And then they have options, whether it's a little combination play to use utilize the width down the flank of the field with their midfielders and their center attacking forwards, creating these like circular rotation runs to get in behind or the outside wing back defender player 
does a long diagonal ball to get in behind. That's what we saw Japan utilize a lot last year in the 2023 She Believes Cup against the United States. But they also have a lot of ability to just keep the ball with possession. A lot of times we use the phrase like tiki taka soccer, but Japan isn't as much uh, concerned with, okay, we have to go forward in these moments. They're really comfortable just doing wall passes, one, two touches to keep possession of it, which forces the little spaces and pockets to open up. They read that, they jump into those holes, and then they move forward. But the most impressive part is that they can technically and tactically adjust in game based on the opponent, which is going to cause big problems for the United States. I totally agree, Lisa. I think another element of their game that we talk about, but it's not as appreciated, is how technical they are. Yes, they'll play those long balls, but their ability to maintain possession, and when even when a team is high pressing them, to break it, remain calm, switch the point of attack, uh, draw in pressure, break it again, you're right, there's no rush. But also, the last time they played the U.S., if you go back and watch that game, they could have scored a few times off of transitions. They are able to break down the U well, whoever they played, but especially in the last She Believes Cup, they were able to break down the U.S. and exploit those spaces that we actually saw Mexico do against the U.S. during the W Gold Cup. And I think Japan, knowing how they play, how technically savvy they are and clean on the ball, looking at those opportunities and going against the U.S. and how they're trying to play technically mm -hmm. a little bit smaller, making the field a little condensed, playing more tucked in, um, limiting the width of the pitch, I think Japan will try to exploit the U.S. in that way. I'm really excited to see how they're going to adapt to whatever the U.S. is going to present. Yes. This is a great opposition for the United States. We've yeah. talked about, you know, being shown where your holes may possibly be before the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And when I think about this Japan team, I think about the best team that I had seen um, in the World Cup. The way that they played was so attractive. Everybody was saying, wow, did you see that Japan team? People that don't normally follow the Women's World Cup were texting me saying, wow, that Japan team is amazing. Um, so that's a team that the U.S. Women's National Team is going up against here. So what do we expect from the U.S. side and how do they tactically approach this one, Lisa? Yeah, I mean, for the U.S., I think we're going to see Twyla Kilgore employ the same tactics that the U.S. did during the Gold Cup. So in possession, can they push the one outside back higher up, whether it creates an overload centrally in the midfield, whether that's Emily Fox, Jenna Knightsong, or Crystal Dunn, whoever that player may be. But creating those overloads centrally um, with almost a double pivot and a box in the midfield, I think that's how the U.S. is going to have a lot more success against Japan, who does like to make the, ball, the field really condensed and try try to build out of those pockets um, and then trying. I want the U.S. forwards to stay wide and utilize their width up top and really <laughs> stretch out as wide as they can, especially know. if that outside fullback does come inside. Um, I, I want someone else to pop out into that outside space. I don't know if we'll actually see that. I wanted to see that when they played Canada. Obviously, it mm -hmm. was they were swimming in that game, so <laughs> we didn't, no we didn't really see any soccer during that match, sadly. <laughs> um, but I think they're going to keep building on making the field small, playing in tight spaces. Japan is a perfect test to do that because it's a team that is technically superior than most teams in the world. Uh, but I think it'll be a good test. Maybe the U.S. will try to be more expansive. Maybe between the halves they will, or they'll come out in that way. But I do think the U.S. is going to try to build on what they started in the W Gold Cup, keeping spaces tight, not playing many long balls, mm -hmm. um, having the wingbacks go super high, tucked in, or almost like a false six. Um, and a lot of rotation between the 10s and the forwards. So I'm intrigued to see what Twyla Kilgore is going to do, how they're going to adapt, how they're going to use these new players that are in camp. I hope we see these new faces that are in camp yeah, and get some so lucrative too. minutes. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I, I think that they're going to stay to what we saw in the W Gold Cup and try to build on it. Well, Darren, we talked about uh, wanting the U.S. women's national team to use the wide areas. What, the person that we saw kind of do that best was Midge Purse, and obviously she's not in this roster. She did tear her ACL and announce that. How much of a miss is she in a tournament like this? She's a massive miss. I think she was really hitting her stride with the national team. We saw elements of her game really improve, especially her crossing ability. Uh, she was in her bag with these 1v1s, as you're seeing now on <laughs> the screen. Was. Um, yeah, she was unstoppable, and it's it's sad, but I do think she's going to come back stronger looking at these clips. I, you know, when you get an injury, it brings a new type of motivation and appreciation for your game. But I do think, you know, if this happens, it's a game of soccer. It's opportunity for players that are coming back in, Mallory Swanson, Katarina Macario, uh, Jaden Shaw even, to get more minutes on the wing or, you know, however the U.S. is going to rotate these positions. But I know it's up for grabs. This will be a really good competition and test to see who can adapt during the game, 
who can score goals, who can create scoring opportunities. Uh, yeah, it's going to be right. interesting to see who has the mentality to so, do it. So, that leads me to how do you get us started, Darian? Let's go ahead and look at your starting 11, how you would get us started. Obviously, Mitch, not someone that you can choose from, but the opportunity. Ooh, Ooh let's I go. I like this already. Take us through it, Darian. I'm excited to see how different each of ours are. Uh, obviously, Alyssa, the wall, Nair in the back. Uh, Crystal Dunn, I don't think anyone's going to knock her off of that position when it's a really strong competition. I know Jenna Nyswanger's had that. A really good moments in the left back position, but I don't, I haven't seen her do too much defending yet. I haven't seen her truly tested. So I love Dunn, Gurma, Davidson, Fox, uh, Coffee, obviously a staple in there. I want to see Macario and Haran playing together as sort of an 8 10. They can alternate. Both of them can play with Smith up top as the nine and rotate these positions. Mallory Swanson in her bag. She's in four right now with Chicago Red Stars. I want to see her come in. She scored last year against Japan. Uh, I'm sure that this would be incredible if she came on the pitch and scored again. And Rodman. I think that 1v1 ability that Rodman has will be really good against Japan. It's going to attract players to her. I think she is so physically dominant. They're not going to be able to stop her. So her sw putting crosses in uh, to Haran and Macario is how they're going to get a Four goals in this match. I'll four say. goals. <laughs> That's a bold statement. It is. I'm well, probably going to be wrong. Doing goal I'm probably going to be wrong. Yet. <laughs> How many are they conceiving here? If they're getting four, maybe one. Okay, so you're giving a four-one. All right, Lisa, take us through your eleven. Looking at me like a crazy person. Yeah, <laughs> we are. We are giving some crazy looks around this studio today. Go ahead, Lisa. What, what's so yours? I was taking note of yours, Darian. I only have three changes from what you uh, rolled out there. I want Casey Murphy in goal. Alyssa Nair is the number one goalkeeper for the United States, but Casey Murphy needs reps before you go to the Olympics. She needs 90 minutes against a team that is going to test her, and Japan is going to test this back line with the center back Davidson and Gurma, they are the center back duo going forward. I want Jenna Nightswanger to be tested defensively. I like her and Emily Fox in that back line because they balance each other with who goes forward and tucks in, who stays back. They're able to read the game and dictate which side is going to step forward and which one is going to hold back. Um, I, I think in the midfield, I love the shout for Katarina Macario. I think she'll get time. I don't think she'll get the starting nod in this center trio. Sam Coffey, Corbin Albert, Lindsey Horan. Um, despite everything that has happened with Corbin Albert, she was the starting center midfielder for this United States women's national team. And uh, I think that Twyla Kilgore is going to keep that moving forward. And with Mallory Swanson back, you can't not start her, Jenny. So Swanson up top with Why Smith and Rodman. Why have you seen my lineup? Why have Amazing. you seen my lineup? <laughs> I love it. I love it. You've made great, many great points there. Um, I, if we go to mine, I agree with you with the Corbin Albert situation. I do think that this is the three that we saw building a little bit on there. It's Corbin Albert, Lindsay Horan, and Sam Coffey for me. Sam Coffey for me is a mainstay. She has to be on there, especially with her performances with Portland Thorns. But you know what? You make a great point about seeing a new goalkeeper, Lisa, that I hadn't really thought about, but I would put Jane Campbell in there instead if we were going to give someone else some time, although Alyssa Nair really solidified her place as number one goalkeeper. I have Casey Kruger in as my left back. That's the only difference that I see on your guys' lineups there, so we don't have to go through the rest of it. I don't know. I think that she's and so strong. Starting. I've really seen her in there. Um, and then when we go to the forward line, that's the one that we can talk about the most. I was really stuck between Sophia Smith or Trinity Rodman. I ended up with Sophia Smith just because of her form lately with the Portland Thorns and making sure that she scores goals, even if Portland Thorns is not firing uh, and winning games here. And for Katarina Macario, I had to see her. You know what? I just have to see her. She's been getting goals. She's been getting assists for Chelsea, and I want to give her time. Obviously, Mal Swanson's return. I want to see her on the pitch against Japan. But I don't get her started here because the way that the season has gone, right, um, the way that Macario is gaining speed, I want to see her start this game, and I want Mouse Swanson to come in, and then Sophia Smith can then shift over to the nine, right? Yeah, um, I like it. But that's what I got for you. I, I like it. I think it's interesting that we had all three different left backs. Yeah. That's what I was saying. The that's left back so is a situation where everything changed. You have Dunn, you have Nicewanger, I have Kruger. A, which means there's, there's a, a lot, lot of competition depth in that position, but no one solidified their spot there. Nobody. Yep. Well, that is great to see. I don't know whose lineup is the best here because everyone had some Mine really great is. points on all of them. I don't know. Everyone <laughs> had some really great points on all of them. We're going to be right back in just a moment with a tactical breakdown on Sam Coffey here on Attacking Third, brought to you by PNC Bank. Brilliantly boring since 1865.
Welcome back to Attacking Third and our Brilliantly Boring segment brought to you by PNC Bank. Brilliantly boring since 1865. We're talking Sam Coffee, the number six position. When we say brilliantly boring, we mean under the radar brilliance. And if any player can do that, it is a number six position, right? That defensive mid is often forgotten, not given the flowers that they deserve. Sam Coffee is one of those players. Why don't we go in through the tactics of what she does here, Darian? Yeah, uh, she is a brilliant player. I think she does a lot of the work that goes unseen, which is what you want from a six. And here, even her rotating the Fox against Brazil during the W Gold Cup final to come back, help the back line, look at her opening up to space, breaking lines with this pass and getting the ball moving forward. I think she shows such good vision and awareness in her defensive positionings and even here, Pouncing on a 50-50 ball, but watch what she does after she wins the initial ball. She stays around. She's waiting for it to come back out. It eventually does. She's still there. And then once again, not only is she tactically aware she's in the right positions, but she shows so much strength. And here, looking at the U.S.'s press, they're obviously trying to funnel in the middle. She gives you just enough space to the midfielder. She pounces on the ball, lays it off to Rodman, and this creates somewhat of a scoring opportunity for the U.S., but really good on Sam Coffey. Coffee invites the pass here centrally. She just gives enough space to say, yeah, play it. And then she just closes down and makes it incredibly difficult. Just a toe poke, enough to give it to Morgan, who gets a shot off. Uh, Coffee played higher up in college just two years ago at Penn State. So she understands positionally where she needs to be if she is higher up on the counter press, uh, playing those balls through to Rodman, as we're seeing there. But now she plays a little bit deeper. So she's trying to utilize her mindset of, OK, how can I break lines with passes while also continuing to be an option for the players around me in case they get into a bind and she demonstrates that perfectly in that tactical package. One of the things a couple seasons ago that was a talking point consistently with Sam Coffey is the fact that she had changed positions right and then she has the brain to be able to think about what the attacker wants to do because she played that and now she's playing as a six we see her great defensive play and always going forward I think that's one of the things that we've pointed out as most important about Sam Coffey but just to break down like how important she is to this midfield that we're building right now Obviously, Rose Lavelle is not here uh, via injury, and you have Sam Coffey coming in and becoming a really important player on this team, Darian. Yeah, she's incredibly important, but I think, you know, what you were saying with her being able to break lines and always looking forward, that's what separates her from, I think, a lot of the other sixes we've seen come in with the U.S. Women's National Team. Not only is she great defensively, she's strong, she anticipates when a ball is going to pop out, maybe when another team is going to make a mistake or her own teammates are maybe going to lose possession of the ball. But when she does win it, she's not just, let me play it safe and go backwards, let me go square. She's actually looking to penetrate and break lines and cause a threat because that is how you alleviate pressure. Mm -hmm. I love this for her. I'm glad she's getting her flowers. I hope we see her get a lot of minutes in the She Believes Cup. And Coffee doesn't just break lines of pressure with passes, too. She's not afraid to go at someone mm -hmm. and, and make a move around them, which definitely can be risky as a defensive midi and a six, but she's good at it. She doesn't overcomplicate things. She keeps it simple, a little scissor move, bypasses one defender, and then breaks lines or bypasses another defender with her pass. It's very impressive to see her calmness and her composure and her bravery on the ball to beat lines of mm -hmm. defense. Okay, we have to bring up her goal, though. It just happened a few days ago for the Portland Thor, and she gets the equalizer past the 90th minute with a goal. Not something that we see from Sam Coffey typically, but what a banger. Yeah, it was an incredible goal. And you could see that she was just in her flow with the goal as well. Um, she knew what was on the line, but that shows she's also a really good leader on this team, not just defensively on the ball, off the ball, um, but she's not afraid to shoot. Mm -hmm. and even out Ho the score. Hopefully that means more goals for coffee at the international level. There you go. Yeah. Well, let's hope so. We will definitely celebrate that for her. All right, we're going to go to a quick break, and we will be having Sandra Herrera join us for the next segment, and we have so many questions for her. Stick with us. We've worked extremely hard to uphold the integrity of this national team through all of the generations. And we are extremely, extremely sad that this standard was not upheld. Um, our fans and our supporters feel like this is a team that they can rally behind. And it's so important that they feel and continue to feel undeniably heard and seen. We stand by maintaining a safe and respectful space, especially as allies and members of the LGBTQ plus community. And this platform has given us an opportunity to highlight causes that matter to us, something that we never take for granted. And we'll keep using this platform to give attention to causes that are important to us. 
It's also important to note we've had internal discussions around the situation and that will stay within the team. But one thing also to note is that we have never shied away from hard conversations within this team. Welcome back into Attacking Third. We just heard from Lindsay Horan and Alex Morgan on the Corbin Albert situation. So for this, we welcome in Sandra Herrera. Sandra, one of the things that they mentioned there is that this has always been a safe space, you know, especially the U.S. Women's National Team, for certain communities. And this kind of goes against that in Corbin Albert's comments or reposts and that they have taken care of it. What are your thoughts? Because you were on the press call, the vibes, the takeaways of the call, Sandra. Yeah, I think there was a, a moment after all of Corbin Albert's social media activity kind of surfaced that if whether or not there, this was going to be addressed, not so much by U.S. soccer, but even the team, because this is a team that has, as Alex Morgan noted, not shied away from kind of uh, having these difficult conversations. Um, so I would um, argue that they're kind of addressing it head on. I think people are very appreciative of that. But I think some, it's something to be said about having a somewhat uh, prepared statement and still kind of showing in the body language the utter disappointment um, with everything that has been ongoing, really, because I don't think this is something that is going to go away quite soon. I think it's, it's important to note that Alex Morgan and Lindsay Horan have also went ahead and said that that there have been internal discussions. Um, and then as Mallory Swanson and Katarina Macario came on to their press conference, they ultimately reiterated that. Uh, they were asked uh, how Corbin Albert has been received in this camp. And Mallory Swanson simply just referred back to the opening statement by Alex Morgan and Lindsay Horan and saying, we're having ongoing discussions. Those are going to remain internal. So uh, I think there's something smart about getting in front of it a little bit, uh, again, because I think something that folks are going to watch in the She Believes Cup is no longer just the fact that they're going to go up against a couple different teams. There's going to be Olympic evaluation. How are certain players going to look? Is, there, is their stock going to go up, go down? But now there's this added layer of a team culture temperature check, essentially. So I think it was important that they try to address it head on, but I think there's always like going to be, you know, certain pockets of the public that want to see a bit more. Very well said, Sandra. I want to go over into the games because U.S. has a really big challenge going against Japan. We're curious how the style of play is going to go up against this really technical, tactical savvy Japanese side who gave them a really hard time last time the U.S. played them. Mal Swanson got the lone goal. How is the U.S. going to win this match? Do they just go ahead and start Mel Swanson then, Darian? Because, listen, I'm, I'm here for it. You're, you're spitting it out. I'm over here just like, yes, confirmed. I would love to see it. Mel Swanson has been someone that has really developed over time in these opening three weeks of NWSL regular season play, putting together pretty lengthy minutes. We're talking, you know, each game about 80-plus minutes. So will she get a start against this Japanese side? I, I think hopefully she will. Uh, but I'm also very curious to see how Twyla Kilgore wants to go across each line, because I think there's something important to know when it comes with Japan, that this was absolutely a team that the United States wanted to play in She Believes Cup. So with the reformatted She Believes Cup, while yes, there's four teams participating and USA is hosting three, they're only going to get to face two of those three teams that they're hosting. So the fact that they said one of those teams is absolutely going to be Japan, I think is very honorable. It has a lot of respect for that program. Yeah, it definitely says a lot about how the U.S. Um, wants to take this tournament, and that's seriously playing against Japan. But, Sandra, the other two nations that are in this, she believes, Cup, Brazil and Canada, they are no teams to sleep on. When you look at Canada, a side that played fairly well during the W Gold Cup, showed a lot of different tactics, their ability to be flexible in games against different opposition. What do you expect to see from Canada during this international window? 
Well, first of all, I just want to say I, I hope the U.S. you know gets to play them in this one because I think when we go back to the Gold Cup and think about how they last faced each other, there, there wasn't really a game of tactics because of the weather that was involved. So we were all really excited to see some of these first steps into this new look era for Canada as well. New contract for Beth Priestman. She's going to be with them through 2027. A couple players have retired from the international level. What is it going to look like moving forward? And they started to show us a bit of that during the Gold Cup. So I think with the influx of players returning, are we going to see Janine Becky involved, you know, a little bit more within this system as well? So I want to look at that. I want to see Janine Becky be able to get some significant minutes in this one. I want to see Chloe Lacasse as well continue to, to build off of uh, her good form. So um, hopefully we get a chance to see them uh, go against the uh, USA. All right, Sandra, that takes us to the last team in Brazil. Obviously, this is a bit of a roster that raises some question marks just because there are some other players that have not been involved that much recently, and they get the call up here. This is more of like, who's going to make this Olympic roster? Who do you think we have to keep our eye on for this Brazil squad? I, you know what, I got to give it to manager uh, Arthur Elias. I, I respect so much that there's a lot of rotation in this Brazil roster. He's absolutely looking at this as an opportunity to get more players in and perhaps take a little bit of a stronger look at Olympic evaluations, especially when we've got not just one, but a couple of pretty savvy veterans in the mix for this She Believes Cup in Marta and Cristiani as well. We're talking over 300 caps for, uh, you know, Brazil's national team. And I would love to see Marta go ahead and get out uh, a run or two in this She Believes Cup. She is a player that is very clearly in form coming off of scoring with Orlando Pride. Are we going to get to see her and are we going to get to see her for extended minutes? Because I know during that previous World Cup, we kind of saw her get utilized in different ways, sometimes getting subbed out of games or coming on late off the bench. So are they going to say, hey, you look like you're in starting form. Go ahead and lead the way. I want to see it. All right. Last question for you. And we have to let you go and go to a break. But is the panic button hit if they lose against Japan and don't go into the final, Sandra? Oh, it's the United States Women's National Team. Of course, people are going to hit a panic button if they don't win <laughs> Japan and compete for the final. I don't know any other team that has been under as much scrutiny as the United States Women's National Team um, in our entire existence. So there will be a certain level uh, of panic, but uh, I don't expect that if that happens that they're going to, you know, come out and say, you know, we're doomed. You know, they're going to obviously say there's things for us to work on and there's still something to play for a third place match. But uh, we'll see what, you know, what, what if it comes down to a draw? You know, what, what's that going to mean for, exactly. for these two stars that she believes? <laughs> Beautiful, Sandra. I had to make a giggle there a little bit because we know there's always the panic <laughs> button hit being hit. Uh, we're going to have a quick break. We'll be previewing the women's Euros and cough qualifying when we return. So stick with us here on Attack in Third. Welcome back in. We head to women's Euros qualifying. Switzerland will be the one hosting the Euro Euro tournament in 2025. But let's talk about the qualifying right now. So there is League A, League B, League C. And in League A, the top two teams in each, each group qualify directly for the Euros. And the rest of the teams go into playoffs. That is to say that no one is eliminated in Group A. I think that's important to mention here. And then in Group B, the top three teams of each group go to the playoffs. Unless one of those top three teams is Switzerland, then the fourth best team would go as well into the playoffs. And that means don't finish last in Group B. If you go into Group C, the group winner and three best second place teams go into the playoffs. So the playoffs will then determine the remaining spots that go to the Euros. So I just wanted to get that out of the way right away because it was a little bit confusing while we were talking about it. Um, the biggest thing, though, Group A is the heavy hitters. Um, let's go through the Group A right now. A1 is Netherlands, Italy, Norway, Finland. Group A2 is Spain, Denmark, Belgium, and the Czech Republic. Group A3 which we have decided is the group of death, is France, England, the current Euro winners, Sweden, and the Republic of Ireland. And then A4 is Germany, Austria, Iceland, Poland. Let's go ahead and get started diving into group A3 because we've mentioned that this is potentially our group of death. Why? We start with France here, um, Darian Urbernards, maybe second to last tournament with France. How important is it for them to get on the front foot? Uh, incredibly important. I think with it being his second to last opportunity with the team um, and he's given them some consistency. I think it's time where they really need to show out. They need to 
score goals. That's mm -hmm. been an issue for France in these big tournaments is them not putting away chances, which is incredible because of how stacked this team is. But they always struggle in big tournaments. Yeah, it they doesn't do. make any sense. On paper, you would think France would just dominate um, yeah. with how much of a presence they have, how many threats they have going forward as well. Mm -hmm. And then whenever it comes to game time, they fall a little flat. Yeah, and I feel like this is a this is the time because they're already going. The Olympics is in Paris. They need to really solidify scoring goals, how they're going to do it, um, putting away their opportunities, playing as a team, being consistent. This team is not consistent for how freaking good these players are. So I hope that we see that. This is a good competition for them going into the tournament. These teams are going to ask a lot of different questions against them, where they're going to have to try to score in a variety of different ways, whether it's set pieces, run of play, individual brilliance. Um, game management is another big game one management. that I think France has struggled with. So. It's a good test. I, I like this for them because we all have some French players that we love watching play. But I'm excited to see what they're going to do for this tournament. Yeah, so many to mention here. Wendy Renard, obviously someone who has been a mainstay on that team for so long. Diani, someone that we have yeah. seen on the flanks just completely dominate and score many goals for France. And Katoto. Yeah, she's back and healthy. Katoto. So In good form. These are yeah, the players really that we want to take a look at. You mentioned, you know, we are excited about a lot of these players and how France decides or I guess starts to score more goals. Um, let's go over to England because they are the title holders currently, um, but they have not qualified for the Olympics. So how important is this tournament for them to kind of show that they are still this big team, even though they don't have the Olympics? There's a lot of pressure on England, I think, to make it back, con considering they are title holders for the Euros. Serena Vigman and this squad, they have a lot to prove, and they get tested immediately in this group with France, Sweden, and Ireland. Defense is my biggest question mark for this squad. Can they get players healthy, right? Millie Bright coming back mm -hmm. into, into the fold. That is where teams are going to hurt this English side, because they can score goals. They have a lot of threats going forward in their front line, but if they get pulled apart and stretch defensively or players get injuries and pick up knocks that's exactly where opposition is going to target them and that's my biggest question mark about England going into this tournament. All right Darian I want to ask you about Ireland because we've seen them kind of on yes. the up and up right um, can they play spoiler in this group. I think so. Uh, yeah. The Irish are to be feared. They are feisty. They, they are <laughs> feisty. They really live up to that. Uh, we saw them play previously in the World Cup and they really challenge teams. They ask a lot of questions. They're incredibly physical. And I think a lot of teams aren't prepped for that. How, how defensive structured they are and how they can expose you on set pieces. Um, they have some superstars on their team that link play a lot and are really, really dangerous moving forward. Player for player, I don't know how well they match up against these bigger squads who have a little bit more depth than Ireland does and a little bit more time together. But it's a time for Ireland to grow. Uh, I think that this is going to be a really good tournament for them. And they may be spoiler. They might, uh, I don't know. I mean, they, they'll still go to playoffs, but they could really challenge these teams. When you look at the FIFA rankings, France is third, England fourth, Sweden fifth, and then Ireland is 24th. So it's, it's not a secret that Ireland is the quote-unquote underdog in this group of death, which gives Ireland a little bit more of an edge. And they're going to bring that physicality. <laughs> that they already, what, they that, needed more Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that edge brings them to a different level physically, which mm -hmm honestly just throws other teams off their game. If, if your opposition is so physical against you and you can't keep the ball, you can't play the style that you want to play, you have to adjust and adapt, and that's what Ireland forces teams to do. They really have nothing to lose, though. You mentioned those okay. rankings there. Sweden, obviously, not qualified for the Olympics. That's the first time ever in history that they have not qualified for an Olympics, so they also have something to prove in this tournament. Uh, let's go over to CAP Olympic qualifying, though. We want to make time for that. Win and go to the Olympics across two legs. So the big ones here, Zambia against Morocco and Nigeria against South Africa. These are massive games if you want to go to the Olympics. Let's talk first Zambia Morocco because they in terms of Zambia are looking for their second consecutive Olympic appearance and they have some notable players here Darian. Yeah uh, incredible players I think you know some of these players play in the U.S. in the NWSL. You have Ifeoma, Barbara Banda. Um, Barbara Banda. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Rachel, Rachel Kudunaji. Yeah, really, really good players. Um, so I think that they're going to be a threat. And Barbara Banda is such a threat going forward. She had two hat tricks in the last Olympics. Girl can it's score. So you love her. I remember you it's talking so about impressive. her. All I around. cannot wait till she joins the Pride. I think it's going to yeah. be insanity. She's going to be the missing piece. Back to the game. I do believe that you know Zambia has the edge. Um, they've been here before. They've done this before. It'll be Morocco's first time. 
but it's going to be interesting to see what Morocco does. We don't. This is still a team that's growing a lot um, under a new coach as well. So I'm, I'm not really sure what to expect from them. It's going to be interesting watching the first leg and how both of these teams adapt moving forward. But I expect a lot of goals. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, attack, 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 offense throughout the boards, not only with Barbara Banda, but with Rachel Kudanaji up top. Their relationship has grown a lot. I think it's going to be dangerous for Zambia, and it's really hard to stop them and slow them down, and Morocco has a big test. I'd expect a lot of goals, a lot of moving forward, some exposure in the back line during this match. Well, I will say that they recently played two friendlies, and Zambia won both of them by quite a few goals. So if that's telling about what will happen in these two legs, there's a little bit there. Let's go over to Nigeria against South Africa. Sorry, Darian. Uh, I want to go back to you on this one because notable players on South Africa as well. Yeah, you have uh, quite a few players that are incredible on the South African side. Uh, sorry, this Jennifer Ushigini, the Thank midfielder. You. That's who I'm jazzed about during this tournament, uh, Jenny. She has really good tactical awareness. She controls the tempo for South Africa. She can play it forward to Tembi Katlana. They've got Sesane in the mm -hmm. front line as well. Uh, South Africa looks pretty dangerous. They are, but Nigeria has the upper hand in their matchups. They have six wins. They've played a total of 11 matches. Nigeria has six wins. Um, but only one coming from a run of play. Oof. Since 2016. That's yes, so tough. Only one win from run of play. Everything um, else has gone to penalties. But one of your good friends uh, plays on Nigeria as well in Anamanu. Yes, yes. I hope she gets a lot of playing time. Go, uh, Ify. I'm excited for this matchup, Nigeria, South Africa. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. going to be a big one to watch. Circled on my calendar. Mm -hmm. I love it, Lisa. I love it. We know that your calendar is full of all the football games all around the world. <laughs> um, so thank you guys for joining us here on Attacking Third, brought to you by PNC Bank. Brilliantly boring since 1865. We're going to be live on YouTube on Saturday following the U.S. Women's National Team match and back in the studio on Monday. Make sure you tune in.